How much do you know about football in Mozambique? What? Literally nothing? Well, today we're going to change all of that, or some of it at least, through the lens of none other than Deportivo Nampula. Hardly a household name outside of East Africa, or indeed, in East Africa, few teams have had a more meteoric rise followed by a spectacular fall in all of world football and the Algado Conquistadors, as they are affectionately known, over the last 15 years. Founded in 1978, as their nickname suggests, by workers at a nearby cotton farm, Algado is Portuguese for cotton, meanwhile the conquistador aspect of their nickname is a reference to Mozambique's colonial past. The island of Mozambique, which is part of modern-day Nampula province, and from which the entire country now takes its name, marked Portugal's entry into trade, politics, and society in the region, after it was reached by Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama, all the way back in 1498. For the first three decades of their existence, Deportivo Nampula were a fairly nondescript local amateur football club, who played in regional lower leagues without ever reaching the Mossambola, Mozambique's top flight. That all changed in 2009, when Deportivo were taken over by a wealthy local businessman and politician named Jose Langa. Langa transformed Deportivo from a humble provincial club founded by cotton farmers into the richest club in East Africa signing a handful of big-name internationals like Benjani and Yakubu, and dominating Mozambican football, before it all came crashing down. Now Langa is on the run from the Russian, American, Ugandan, British and Portuguese authorities, amongst others, Deportivo are in crisis, having lost all of their funding, and the city of Nampula, which is as storied and fascinating as the club itself, has been left with the most controversial white elephants in the heart of a region mired by conflict. I know, there is a lot to get through. So sit back, relax, and join me, just as you've always wanted to, on a journey to Mozambique, the birthplace of a Ballon d'Or winner and one of the greatest footballers of all time, which was a Portuguese colony until 1975, as we take a look at a football club with a past as tumultuous as the nation itself, in a tale of colonialism, neo-colonialism, civil war, terrorism, triumph and deceit. Before we get into all of that though, I should note that Getty Images don't seem to have many football photographers based in Mozambique, disgracefully so in my view, so there may be less visual stimulus than usual, I might have to get a bit more creative, and feel free to treat this as more of a podcast if you don't already do that with all of my videos. The city of Nampula is a relatively new one, first founded by the Portuguese colonial army in 1907. Despite only being granted city status in 1956, Nampula is now the third largest city in Mozambique, behind only the capital city Maputo and neighbouring Matola, with a population of roughly three quarters of a million people. That makes Nampula roughly the same size as Leeds and Frankfurt, and just like those two, the city's football clubs have long underachieved. Before Deportivo Nampula's rapid rise over recent years, teams from Nampula had won a combined total of just two Mossambola titles since the league was founded in 1976. In football, as is the case with so many sectors in Mozambique, the capital of Maputo looms large. Home to barely 5% of Mozambique's population, Maputo accounts for more than 20% of the nation's GDP, and an even higher proportion of their services and corporate sectors. Meanwhile, clubs from Maputo have won a total of 50 Mossambola titles, compared to just 12 that have been won by every club based outside of the capital combined. The reason Nampula's population exploded so rapidly after it was elevated to city status in the mid-1950s is because of its strategic military importance. During the bloody Mozambican War of Independence, as Portugal refused to give up one of its oldest colonies well into the 1970s, tens of thousands were killed or perished in the fight for freedom and independence. In May 1498, Vasco da Gama became the first European to reach India by sea, landing on the coast of Calicut 
at the end of a 10-month voyage. To reach India by sea from Lisbon, as you can see on this map, da Gama had to sail around the entire African continent and then back up between Madagascar and what is now Mozambique. That made Mozambique a key strategic stop-off and trade route for the Portuguese, and da Gama spent almost all of March 1498 in the vicinity of Mozambique Island en route to India. At that time part of Arab-controlled territory in East Africa, fearing that the local population would be hostile towards Christians, da Gama impersonated a Muslim. Don't do that just as a life lesson, in order to gain an audience with the local sultan, but unable to offer the sultan a suitable gift, da Gama and his men were forced to flee the island, though not without firing his cannons into the city whilst departing the harbour, in retaliation. The island of Mozambique, which was then known simply as Mozambique, before that name spread to mean what is now Nampula province and eventually the entirety of modern-day Mozambique, was ruled by a wealthy Arab merchant named Musa bin Bik, hence the island's name, Mozambique. One man, therefore, Musa bin Bik, now has an entire nation named after him. Despite da Gama's initial retreat, throughout the early 1500s, the Portuguese empire established several colonies, which came to be collectively known as Portuguese East Africa. Portugal's colonial project was politically formalised during the Scramble for Africa, during which time Cabo Delgado province, less than 100 miles north of Nampula, was acquired from German East Africa, meanwhile the island of Mozambique, less than 100 miles east of Nampula, served as the capital of Portuguese East Africa all the way up until 1898. Shortly after World War II, a period of decolonization in Africa and Asia began, as major colonies like India and Indonesia gained independence. Following a political crisis, Portugal's democratic but unstable First Republic was overthrown in a coup in 1926 and replaced by the significantly less democratic Second Portuguese Republic, which became known as Estado Novo. Antonio de Oliveira Salazar, who ruled Portugal as a de facto dictatorship from 1932 through to 1968, led a corporatist state which was fiercely opposed to communism, socialism, syndicalism, anarchism, liberalism, and anti-colonialism. As such, during an era of broader decolonization, Portugal and Salazar actually had a renewed interest in maintaining ownership of Portugal's colonies attempting to Europeanise the territories Portugal had colonised and assimilate them into Portuguese culture. It wasn't very successful, however, and a rise in nationalist and anti-Portuguese sentiment led to the creation of Frelimo in 1962, the Liberation Front of Mozambique in English, and the outbreak of the Mozambican War of Independence in September 1964. The Portuguese made the small city of Nampula, the strategic military centre of their fight against Ferralino, which meant rapid development and a large population influx throughout a conflict which spanned almost exactly 10 years. Because Ferralino was at that time explicitly communist, in addition to being nationalist, it was supported by several communist and socialist regimes, most notably the Soviet Union. Nonetheless, militarily, Mozambique's guerrilla fighters outnumbered by between two or three to one, were always on the back foot. And it wasn't until the Carnation Revolution, a military coup led by left-leaning military officers, overthrew the Estado Novo regime in 1974, that Portugal's colonial wars finally came to an end, and Mozambique gained independence, along with the likes of Guinea, Boisseau and Angola. And then came a period of prolonged peace and prosperity for Mozambique. No, not really. When Portugal transferred power to Frelimo, Mozambique became a single-party socialist state, which didn't play too well with some countries within the broader context of the Cold War. The United States feared that Mozambique would come under the influence of the Soviet bloc, who had supported them in their fight for self-determination. Meanwhile, Rhodesia and apartheid South Africa feared the implications of Mozambique's new government on their own countries, and so a civil war broke out in 1977. 
Renamo, the Mozambican National Resistance in English, became Frelimo's official opposition, backed by Rhodesia, South Africa, and Israel, amongst others, whilst Frelimo was supported by the Soviet Union, North Korea, China, Brazil, and Zimbabwe after Robert Mugabe came to power in 1980, again, amongst others. The Mozambican Civil War spanned 15 years ending in stalemate in 1992 after the Soviet Union had been dissolved and the Cold War had ended, by which stage more than a million Mozambicans had either been killed or had starved to death as the result of famine, and a further 5 million had been displaced. When Mozambique's War of Independence ended and the Portuguese withdrew from Nampula, Mozambicans from the city's surrounding rural areas moved in and squatted in deserted unplanned settlements. During the Mozambican Civil War, Nampula saw a far greater population influx as refugees from rural areas of Mozambique poured into the ever-expanding metropolis. As far as Mozambican authorities were concerned, this was a temporary measure, and most refugees would return to the rural areas they previously called home once the conflict came to an end. Except, they didn't, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is why Nampula is the third largest city in Mozambique, and it only took me 10 to 15 minutes to explain it, and I haven't mentioned football once. Brilliant, I know, but it is always good to have some context, and given the demographic makeup of my audience, tell me if I'm wrong, but I doubt that most of you will have been taught much Mozambican history at school. Deportivo Nampula, see, I told you we'd get to the football eventually, were founded just one year into the Mozambican Civil War, which is something of a misnomer given the extent to which it was a proxy war, whilst its population was still growing at a rapid rate. Since Portugal colonised Mozambique for the best part of 500 years, it's little wonder that Mozambican culture remains heavily influenced by that period. Whilst most of the population is bilingual or multilingual, Portuguese is the country's official language, and despite the geographic gulf between the two countries, Portugal is among Mozambique's five largest trading partners, along with the likes of South Africa and China. Football is also obviously a key cultural tie between Portugal and Mozambique, with Mozambican players only having been eligible to represent Portugal up until the 1978 World Cup, and it wasn't actually until the 1982 World Cup that an independent Mozambique finally became FIFA members. It is difficult to downplay the significance of Mozambican players on Portuguese football. In the 1950s, Portuguese football was a joke. The national team had never qualified for a major tournament, and in 1947, England beat Portugal 10-0 at the stunning new Estadio Nacional in Lisbon, which was considered the best stadium in the world at the time. In the 1960s, though, inspired by two of the greatest footballers of all time, Mario Coluna and Eusebio, both hailing from Mozambique, Portugal became a force on both the club and international stage. In 1961, Benfica became the first club other than Real Madrid to win the European Cup and they defeated Los Blancos themselves in the 1962 final to be crowned as back-to-back -back champions, meanwhile Portugal qualified for the World Cup for the first time in 1966, where they finished third with four players from Mozambique in their starting 11, and Eusebio won the golden boot. Growth of football in Mozambique was spurred on by leading Portuguese clubs like Sporting and Benfica, founding several feeder clubs in the country, bringing the most talented players over at a young age, and incorporating them into their own teams. Sadly, since gaining independence, and having been plagued by conflict and mass deprivation, Mozambique's talent pool has dried up. Inevitably, the talent will still be there, but the coaching, infrastructure, development and opportunities are not. And Mozambique rank 114th in the world, they have never qualified for the World Cup, nor have they got beyond the group stage of the African Cup of Nations. The outlook is even more dire for the club game in Mozambique. No team from Mozambique has ever made the final of the CAF Champions League, 
And in the most recent CAF coefficient five-year rankings, Mozambique fell nine places, making them the joint lowest-ranked African nation, tied with Togo on just one point. This was the environment that Nampulan businessman Jose Langa entered into in 2009 when he took ownership of Deportivo Nampula. It is little wonder, therefore, that a serious cash injection would result in a pretty rapid rise, and Langa poured millions of Mozambican Metacals into the club. In fairness, a million Mozambican Metacals is still less than £13,000, and he put in far more than that, but you get the general idea. Langa was said to have made his fortune in the cultivation and trade of cassava. Mozambique is one of the poorest countries in the world, unsurprisingly given its past, with agriculture still accounting for roughly a third of the country's economic output and a far greater proportion, around 70%, are employed in the agricultural sector. Cassava is the most intensively cultivated crop in Mozambique by weight, as the country produces close to 10 million tons of it annually, which makes Mozambique the ninth largest producer of cassava worldwide. You don't get stats like that from Thogden or on Football Daily, do you? With his vast wealth, Langa began professionalising Deportivo, starting by taking the club full-time before signing a series of big-name players and launching a hugely ambitious infrastructure project. Between 2010 and 2015, Deportivo won five successive promotions, reaching the Mossambola for the very first time. One of East Africa's most famous footballers in recent years, Benjani, from neighbouring Zimbabwe, was Langa's first big-name arrival. Signed off the back of two seasons playing in South Africa, which were themselves preceded by eight years playing in the Premier League, for the likes of Portsmouth, Manchester City, and Blackburn Rovers. Benjani was joined in an admittedly ageing, but nonetheless still star-studded forward line, by fellow former Premier League star Yakubu, a man who scored 95 Premier League goals, which is the same number as Ruud van Nistelrooy and more than Fernando Torres, and is Nigeria's third highest goal scorer of all time. Joining them, briefly, on Deportivo's right flank was Dominguez, who has spent most of his career starring in South Africa, who is, admittedly, also no spring chicken, but is still going strong and recently became Mozambique's most capped footballer of all time at the age of 39. Just to be clear, I said capped, not clapped. Langa also convinced former Tottenham star Benoit Asuakoto to come very briefly out of retirement. The French-born Cameroon international has long maintained that football is nothing more than a job to him and said that money is his only motivation. And, true to his word, his last payday following stints at St. Etienne and Metz came in Mozambique. Deportivo's high-profile players were soon joined by a high-profile manager in the form of Italy's 2006 World Cup winning captain Fabio Cannavaro, who spent about eight months managing the club in between spells with Al Nasser in Saudi Arabia and Tanjin Kwanjan in China, for the love of the game. It was reported in 2019 that Deportivo were in talks with former England boss Sven Goran Eriksson after he parted company with the Philippines national team, thus making Deportivo Nampula the only club ever to have offered Sven a shed load of cash, which he has actually turned down. Whilst that might be their most remarkable feat and claim to fame, Deportivo also enjoyed significant success on the pitch. Following five straight promotions, Deportivo finished as top-flight runners-up in the 2016 season, missing out on the Mossambola title to Feiro Vario Bieira by just six points, who were themselves crowned as champions for the first time since 1974, four years before Deportivo had been founded. The inevitable could only be delayed for so long, though. And in 2017, Deportivo Nampula won their first Mossambola title, followed by their second in 2018 and a third in 2019, each with a wider margin of victory than the last. In the 2019-20 season, Deportivo even qualified for the group stage of the CAF Champions League, though they were unable to win a single game in the group of death 
up against TP Mazembe, Zamalek, and Sudan's Al Hilal. By this stage, Deportivo Nampula had a new home ground, the enormous and very modestly named Estadio de Jose Langa, built at a cost of more than $50 million and capable of hosting 42,000 spectators in unparalleled comfort when compared with the rest of the league. It seemed as though Deportivo Nampula were primed to become African powerhouses. But then came 2020, a year in which two key things happened. Firstly, there was a pathogen which went by the name of COVID-19 and caused a fair bit of disruption, you may have heard of it, which arrived in Mozambique via a 75-year-old man from the United Kingdom and caused the 2020 Mossambola season to be cancelled. Admittedly, it wasn't COVID's most notable scalp, but perhaps the most important as far as Deportivo Nampula were concerned, as their massive brand spanking new stadium was left totally empty. More significant still, however, was intelligence gathered by South African authorities that Jose Langa was involved in the illegal trade of arms to ISIS-affiliated Islamist militants in Mozambique. According to the South Africans, and since then verified by the British and Americans aiding Mozambique in their efforts to combat the threat of ISIS, Langa's cassava business has long been just a front. And rather than trading a root vegetable, which is the third largest source of carbohydrates in the tropics, behind rice and maize, Langa was actually trading weapons to ISIS loyalists, Al-Shabaab, mercenaries, and various organized crime groups, which were subsequently used to kill people and weren't a source of carbohydrates at all. Langa has been on the run since mid-2020, leaving Deportivo Nampula in the lurch. The club's big-name players have long since departed. Fabio Cannavaro still couldn't even point to Mozambique, let alone Nampula on a map. And in 2021, the club was relegated, leaving the Estadio de Jose Langa, which still bears the name of the club's bandit's owner, as an enormous white elephant. No, not really. I just made all of that up. Well... Not all of it, actually. It, it, it is actually a quite frighteningly accurate history of Mozambique, better than you are likely to find anywhere else on YouTube, so rest assured that you haven't been totally shortchanged, and I haven't entirely robbed you of 20-odd minutes of your life, but there is no Deportivo Nampula, no Jose Lang, and no Islamic State. Honestly, did you really believe that there were a load of people going around cutting people's heads off in Mozambique whilst claiming that they were doing the work of God and believing that they'd secured themselves a first-class ticket to paradise? You'll believe anything, you lot. Oh. No. App apparently, they they do actually exist, and uh, that they are doing that in Mozambique. Just not with Jose Langer's weapons, and not to the detriment of Deportivo Nampula. The first clue, if I had fooled you up to this point, is that Deportivo is Spanish and Mozambique was a Portuguese colony for almost half a millennium. If my fictitious Nampula-based football club was real, they would, of course, be called Desportivo Nampula. Though, I can confirm that they don't exist either. Nampula is very much real, just to be clear, as is everything that I've said about it. The city's two title winners are Sporting Nampula and Ferravario de Nampula, Mossambola champions in 1959 and 2004 respectively, so they are genuinely significant underachievers as the third largest city in Mozambique, badly in need of some kind of a wealthy benefactor, though preferably not one, who claims to cultivate and trade cassava whilst actually arming extremist Islamist rebels. Interestingly, or I thought so at least, the president of 2004 Mossambola title winners, Ferroviario de Nampula, from 1993 to 2002, namely Philippe Nussi, is now the president of Mozambique. You see, some YouTubers make April Fool's Day videos saying that they're quitting, creating fake beef with someone else on the platform, or pranking their parents by turning them blue. 
I invented a football club in Mozambique and outlined their fictitious rise and fall in excruciating detail whilst remaining sensitive to the realities of both historic and present-day Mozambique. There are levels to this game, and also I need help. The two are not mutually exclusive. Just to be absolutely clear then, Benjani Yakubu and Benoit Asuakoto have never played in Mozambique. Fabio Cannavaro will manage literally anywhere if the money is right, but it hasn't been in Mozambique just yet. And Dominguez is Mozambique's most capped player at the age of 39, isn't clapped, at least as far as I know, is still playing in South Africa, but doesn't play for Deportivo Nampula, because they don't exist. The Estadio de Jose Langa, in case you were wondering, is actually the Estadio de Zimpeto, opened in 2011 just outside of Maputo, not in Nampula, funded and built entirely by the Chinese government, who have invested heavily in developing countries in recent years, receiving both praise and condemnation on account of their motives in equal measure, but we won't get into a discussion about neo-colonialism and China's increased involvement in global affairs today. I'm not saying, to be clear, that we won't get into it at some stage, just not today, because today is all about football clubs in Mozambique that don't actually exist, and ambitious, but ultimately criminal, and even more importantly than that, entirely fictitious owners named Jose Langer because Jose is the most common first name in Mozambique, and Langer is the most common second name. Yes, I really am that lazy. Yet I couldn't find anyone particularly notable that went by the name Jose Langer. That guy there is actually Salimo Abdullah, by the way, president of the Business Confederation of the Community of Portuguese-speaking Countries, and not, I repeat, not, the supplier of arms to any terror organisations, as far as I'm aware. I really can't emphasise that point enough. The reason that I picked Mozambique is because for as long as I can remember, given my penchant for covering obscure topics on this channel, people have commented increasingly ridiculous video ideas in a desperate attempt to get likes, yes, don't think that I can't see you, such as seven footballers in Mozambique with no heads, and the seven best left-backs in the Mozambique 7th division who are right-footed. And for some reason, the country always seems to be Mozambique. I've also long been interested in Mozambique, firstly because of the flag, which is the only flag in the world which has got a gun on it, a Kalashnikov rifle to be more precise, along with a hoe and a Soviet-style star, and secondly because of the song Mozambique by Bob Dylan, which was written in 1975, the same year that Mozambique won its independence, and which many people therefore expected to include some kind of powerful commentary on Mozambique's fight for self-determination, but was actually quite a light-hearted song with a fun little ditty about Mozambique making for an ideal romantic getaway due to the sun seeing pretty girls. Some people have speculated that Dylan wrote the song purely to spite his own fans, who he anticipated would be irritated by him trivialising such a serious subject, but I've always quite liked it. And it does occur to me at this point that I could be accused of having done the exact same thing. Bob, Dylan and I, masters of our craft, far too talented for the fields in which we occupy, trivialising the seriousness of matters in Mozambique, just two peas in a pod. In all seriousness, that was not my intention, and making this video has only served to motivate me even more to make an actual video about football in Mozambique, particularly because I do find it interesting, and depressing in equal measure, that two of Portugal's greatest players of all time were really Mozambican, yet since gaining independence and being so troubled by conflict, the country has been unable to produce any players of even remotely similar calibre. So if there are any Mozambicans watching with good ideas, and I know that you're out there, all 500 a month of you on average, which puts Mozambique 121st in terms of national HITC7's viewership, then feel free to let me know. 
I genuinely hope one day to visit Mozambique, and I suppose now I would have to go to Nampula in an endless and inevitably unsuccessful search for the Estadio de Jose Langa. For the rest of you, happy April Fool's Day. Thank you very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. Just call me an idiot if you want. Or yourselves if you were fooled up until the big revelation. Uh, yeah, as I say, and also make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on, both for this channel, HITC7s, and my backup channel, both of which should be on your screens now. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. Happy April Fools.